hope you're all paying attention because I don't have all day. Boris has asked me to discuss with you the moral uh, arguments surrounding his uh, web page on the internet. I would have thought if you turned to me for any length of time you would know this anyway. I'm just waiting to see if you can stop talking and pay attention. Thank you. Right. Uh, now, if we take a, a look at this ethically, we can see that there are perhaps a two-pronged approach in terms of thinking of the moral arguments, the two major schools of thought. That is the deontological approach and the utilitarian approach. If you can remember them, the deontological approach is a duty-based approach. And that is that we have a moral duty to maintain certain ethical standards. The utilitarian approach is about the greatest good for the greatest number. If we're looking at a deontological approach, we can look at the words of Immanuel Kant. And be careful how you say that when you've had a lot to drink. <laughs> Uh, well, anyway, Immanuel Kant said, if you remember, that we should treat others as we would wish to be treated ourselves. Now, if we think about this, logically, would you want your skin cut off while you were still conscious and be left in a heap to die? Hands up anybody who would? Not many people. So therefore, why should we apply this same principle to animals? It seems to me morally indefensible to argue that an animal is a mere commodity. I have never been um, agreed really with the argument or, or been cognizant with the argument that an animal can be purchased. I don't see how you can purchase a life. The life belongs to the animal concerned. Therefore, it seems to me that we have a duty under stewardship to ensure that life is respected and treated with uh, the, the, the level of consideration that we would wish our life to be treated. It takes no account of the fact that some people have proven with animal experiments that some animals, particularly primates, have a high level of intelligence. It strikes me that as long as the animal is capable of sentience, that is, the ability to suffer, then it seems to me that we have a moral duty, a moral obligation, to treat the animal properly and reduce pain and suffering at every opportunity. I am not really persuaded by the argument that human life is more significant in this regard than animal life. We are both equally able to experience pain and suffering, and therefore pain and suffering in both human and animal life should, I feel, be minimised. Uh, if we take a utilitarian approach, taking the view that it's the greatest good for the greatest number, I suppose we'd have to argue the greatest number of cats in these circumstances. Um, it seems to me equally logical that we cannot justify it using a utilitarian approach. Neither can we justify the use of fur from the greatest good for the greatest number of people, as clearly it is not a necessity uh, to use fur in this day and age. We're not all living in the Arctic Circle. There are plenty of morally acceptable alternatives. Now, Boris, as you know, is a very intelligent cat. He talks to me regularly, don't you, dear? Yes. Loving the putty cat, yeah. He talks to me regularly and he has actually persuaded me to write to Downing Street to ask for an e petition to be put up supporting his campaign. Um, quite a few similar petitions are actually there on the Downing Street website at the moment, but I just happen to think mine is the best. <laughs> Uh, I don't know if it's going to be accepted or not, uh, because they might refuse it on the grounds that it's very similar to other petitions. However, Boris has asked me to say to you that if the petition is put up, uh, he sincerely hopes that you will all be supporting it. It seems to me that those of us who have benefited from the educational process have a moral duty to exercise good choice. In this case, to support and minimise suffering. As nurses, we support and minimise suffering in the general population, or at least that's what we're supposed to do, and I see no reason why morally we should extend that to the animal kingdom. Well, I hope you've all got that, uh, because I'm not given to giving Sunday afternoon lectures about ethics, but uh, I hope that that's absolutely totally ingrained in your memory bank. So let's just quickly go through some of the words, shall we? Day ontological approach. Manual Kant, utilitarianism, 
uh, perhaps the view that an animal is unable to exercise autonomous choice because it's unable to forward plan, although that is a debatable point in terms of autonomy, uh, certainly they're able to exercise self-rule. Um, then we have the concept of animal intelligence and animal sentience. I think these are the key issues I would want you to take away from this mini lecture. Um, I have asked Boris to pass comment upon this uh, little lecture. He has been listening to it um, very interestingly down by my feet here. I won't move the camera because uh, uh, because he's a bit camera shy. Okay, but um, I shall be certainly talking to you in the future about this and make sure that you fully understand all the principles concerned. We have a beneficent paternalistic intervention when we're taking care of the welfare of others that are less capable than ourselves or in the case of animals who are not able to express autonomous choice. Right, I hope you've got that in your head because I shall be checking up in the near distance future. And thank you for listening to Boris Vision. Um, he does appreciate it. He often says to me that he's very fond of my students. And he's a lovely little pussycat. And uh, he thinks that he prefers to have his fur on <laughs> as opposed to off. So bye-bye, everyone. See you again soon. Bye-bye. This is the Boris University closing. Bye.